Buju and welcome to Indigicast, the podcast where me and my mates chill, hang out, and just talk about anything indigenous. Today's episode is episode four, and today's guest is my friend Connor Martin. Hello, Connor. Hi, Seth. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm great. <laughs> I just that's, feel like so that's... awkward now that we're recording. <laughs> it, it, it's bound to happen, but it's fine. We'll laugh about it. It'll just, it's part of the vibes. I, I embrace the awkwardness in terms of recording. I do. I gotta, I gotta loosen up. Right? If I don't embrace it, I'm just like, then it makes me want to cry. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Um, yeah. So, to start with every other episode, we are going to get a little introduction from you, if that's cool. Yeah. Okay. So, um, my name's Connor. I, I'm from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. I'm Mohawk Nation, and I'm from the Bear Clan. Um, so what do I, I guess a little bit about what I do. I don't like, I have a hard time calling myself a filmmaker, but I call myself a filmmaker because that's what I aspire to be. Um, yeah. I've only, I've only directed one film, uh, one short film so far, but um it was it went well, so I'm gonna keep, keep <laughs> at it, um, keep going at it. But I also um, am currently I currently just finished up a project actually called Creative Native, and that's actually how Seth and I met. Um, it is a creative project geared uh, to Indigenous youth and introducing them to the creative arts, helping them find their um, their artistic expression, helping them refine it, and also like just giving them exposure to different artists. And that um, is in partnership with Ryerson University and um, Buffy St. Marie. And so I got into that because I actually graduated from Ryerson um, in 2020, right at the peak of, or right at the very start of COVID, I graduated. Um, and I was naive enough to think that I would have a graduation in the summertime, but <laughs> that still hasn't happened. <laughs> um, but I joined that project in my final year of university. So I was like using it as my internship, but I was getting paid, which is a hack that a lot of people don't try to do. They like, don't know that they can use their jobs as their internships if they're like creative um so that was really cool where as a lot of my friends didn't get paid for their internships um there's something else oh yeah (laughs) I am after graduating (laughs) I um started kind of like my own little like media production company I just do freelance uh media production for small indigenous businesses in my community and individuals as well and different organizations in my community where I um, mostly focus on um, video production but I also do a little bit of graphic design and photography if people need it but I don't like to advertise myself as a photographer I know the basics but there are much better photographers out there than I am so (laughs) Um, but that's a little bit about what I do and what I've been doing the past like two years I would say nice Mm -hmm. um Let's see. My brain blanked for a hot minute there. Uh, what is what's the film that you directed? So it's called Face of Resilience, and um, I kind of wish I had like a more um, exciting or like unique title, but I actually do like like the title for what it was. Um, it's called Faces of Resilience, and it's a um, three part mini docu series that highlights stories of indigenous success and resilience um, told firsthand through interviews with indigenous professionals. Um, And professionals, I say that in a Western term. So um, we have an episode with Pam Palmiter, who is a indigenous rights activist, um, a lawyer, a professor, all of that. She's very successful in um, the Western industry, but she is an activist and advocates a lot for indigenous um, sovereignty and, and and different things like that. She's really amazing. She was one of my professors at school, actually, when I was in school. Um, And then we have an episode with Lyle Thompson. He is a um, professional athlete. He, he plays in the NLL and he, I believe still plays for the Georgia Swarm. Um, 
and he is an Anadaga. Um, he's from Anadaga. He's from the Anadaga Nation, which is one of the six nations. Um, so kind of like a relative. Um, and then we have uh, Jen Harper. I don't know why I was blanking on her last name. <laughs> uh, from Chico and Beauty, and hers was like a really amazing. Um, uh, story and we wanted to have we chose those people because we wanted to have like a well rounded uh, group of stories to tell because the series was aimed towards indigenous youth I do a lot of work with indigenous youth I guess like indig- like my peers I guess because I am still I do still consider myself an indigenous youth um, yeah so um, just like aimed towards showing other indigenous youth these positive stories and these um, incredible people in our communities because I, the reason I wanted to do it that way is because I was like very fortunate, I believe in having really, really great role models. I have, I come from a family where my parents are still together. Um, I have a lot of, a lot of siblings, a lot of Um, really positive role models in my aunts and uncles and stuff like that but I also know that like that is very I'm kind of the outlier in a lot of my friends (laughs) my friends don't come from places like that and a lot of uh, younger people don't come from those same situations and so I credit a lot of like my life and my uh, positive attitude and positive thinking to having positive role models and so I really wanted to use my opportunity to showcase something and to create something and um, try to sh- like just show Indigenous youth that like these people are out there, these people are the same as you, um, and that like you know if you want it you can do it as well. And that's a lot of the same thing that those those individuals have said in those episodes. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about that. <laughs> that I positive. love that. I really yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was going to say something else, but I can't remember now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, no, I love that. I I like the whole part where you were talking about how you want to like cater what you create towards Indigenous youth, right? Mm-hmm. And I like that because like, I relate to that also personally, right? Mm-hmm. And for me, part of it is just because there wasn't much of youth directed stuff in my res, mm-hmm. right? Like there was community stuff, but there was another stuff. There were, wasn't really stuff that was like, I guess, just for the kids. There was to an extent, but it wasn't really anything in terms of learning and I guess just like confidence stuff right like it was just Mm -hmm. more physical activity stuff to keep kids busy right Mm -hmm. which obviously i'm grateful for but nowadays especially with how big social media is and that if not you know everybody probably uses it if anything right Mm -hmm. it's one of those things that like need to be talked about also and it's it hurts kids it really does right Mm -hmm. and i think that it's like also something that like I want to do right. I want to. I want to do stuff with my community for my community. I want my community to see stuff that I do because I want to be like that role model for a lot of kids too, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that like that's like a way that like a lot of people. I think that's a something that a lot of indigenous like filmmakers specifically have in common is that like you know we're trying to create things to show like to tell our stories and like become those role models that like we didn't have. Cause I know I didn't know anybody. I know there are people in my community doing it like filmmakers and actors and things like that, but I didn't know anybody personally. I wasn't really like exposed to all that. And so like, I know that just like seeing somebody doing it, even if you don't know them, it can like um, really positively influence them. Like, oh, that person's from my community and they're, like, a actor. Like, I can be an actor, too. Like, just, like, I just find that I want to be successful for myself, but I also want to be successful to show other people that we can all be successful. You know what I mean? Like, we can find success in a Western 
um, definition, I guess. Like, it is success is kind of like um, subjective, I guess. But yeah, um, in a Western sense, I find that um, to realize <laughs> to realize that you don't need to be successful in that way, you almost have to find success there because then once you find the success there and you know you're making money and you're being you're able to support yourself in that sense you realize that like oh this isn't that fulfilling like there's like (laughs) I find fulfillment more so in like you know doing community work and like working yeah doing work with indigenous youth like you find it's kind of a little bit backwards but that's the route that I went and I think that that's the route a lot of people find themselves in it it does make sense it does Mm -hmm. right like, yeah. When you do think about it, it's like the the I, the most common I like vision of success, right, is making money and being happy, right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But especially as Indigenous people, it's just like our versions of success are also going to be different than people who are not Indigenous, right. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. our elders always push community right they always push family they always push like loving each other and everything right Mm -hmm. but you don't you don't see those kind of community like stuff out Mm -hmm. in the world right so it's hard to like kind of explain that with other people to like Mm -hmm. yeah I'm doing this for them they're like but are you paying you I'm like no but like right (laughs) yeah yeah right it makes me happy it makes them happy right Mm -hmm. yeah exactly now, I'm curious about, I am curious about what it was like growing up on your res, just, just because of how big it is. And <laughs> now for context, right? For context, mm-hmm. my reserve, Manitou Rapids for Na- First Nations or Rainy River First Nations, which is like way out in Northwestern Ontario, mm-hmm. we have a total of estimated about 1,100 band members. Oh, that's a lot. Oh, wait, wait, I mean, 1100. I no, thought you said 11,000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. 1100 and about yeah. 300 living on reserve. Okay. Oh, my goodness. No, yeah. And in context, Six Nations has about 27,000 band members with about 13,000 living on reserve. Yeah, we're huge. Like, right. And like, even like my town, Emo, Ontario. Has about, mm-hmm. I think it's 1,300 people living in it. I think that's the population, give or take. Oh, my goodness. Right? Like, that's, cr- that's crazy insane to me. And, like, it's funny because when I went to school, like, I was, like, like, when I went to school um, in high school, I was, like, a small town kid. But everybody else was, like, a small town kid in a sense. But then when I went to university, I was, like, really a small town kid. So, like... I don't know. It's like perspective because I went to school, like obviously with like all non-Indigenous people, but um, like I was like, I was from the country. Like I was from like the farmland. Yeah. That's what everyone thought. But I'm like, no, like, I don't know. I have like, we're the most populous community in I think all of Canada. But yes, I do believe like, so too. I don't know. Growing up here, I don't have anything to compare it to. Um, but it was... So I went to, I think there are four, if not five, elementary schools here, which was like normal on the to res. me. Yeah, like on the res, uh, which was very normal to me. But like, I know now that like, you know, one school on the res is like a big deal. Like it's, that's. My that's, res doesn't have any. Yeah. And like some kids don't, <laughs> have, some reses don't even have their schools on reserve. So I think we had, I think we have five. Um right now because I think there was three main ones and then we have which was a little bit new when I was younger was um the Mohawk Immersion School and now there's a I think it's like a I think it's like an elementary so like kindergarten to I think maybe maybe grade six um and that's another Mohawk Immersion land-based school which is really cool um but I went to one of the the big three and um there was like we had you know grade grades eight to no we had sorry grades kindergarten to grade eight I think but some kids 
um, once you went to grades, once you got to grade six or finished grade six, you went to um, this like middle school and it was like grade seven and eight. Um, so it was like, you go to the, it's in like right in the main like village area. It's called uh, JC Hill Elementary and it's basically like a middle school. And so you get a taste of like transitioning through classrooms and like, you know, like your first part of the day is spent in like your homeroom class kind of I guess it's like your homeroom class and then you have your other subjects that you cycle through like you go to a different classroom it's kind of it's it, it's really interesting it kind of gets you ready for high school um but that's where like all of the once you're out of grade six that's where all of the schools kind of intersect so that's where a lot of I met a lot of new people when I was younger um which is funny because like and in any res, it's like stereotypical. Like you know, everybody, everybody knows each other. Everybody knows each other's business. Like, yeah, um, just a little bit, eh? <laughs> yeah, and so at least it's, it's, it's especially what it's like here. <laughs> yeah, and so we like went to this new elementary school, and like all the schools came together, or all the students from the schools came together. And I knew some kids from like sports and stuff. Like, I played baseball, and like what else did I do? I figure skated. And so like you knew some kids from those sports and whatnot, but like there were so many new kids that you would be meeting too. And like, um, it's like weird to think that I didn't know them before that age sometimes because now I know like they're all like my friends and stuff, but yeah. Um, and then we like high school, you kind of split up like across, like around in the surrounding areas. And then we have like a we're pretty like well surrounded by cities. We have like Caledonia, which has high school. We have Brantford, which has like four high schools. Um, so like then everybody kind of splits up. But like growing up before that, I think I don't know. We had like a lot of we have a lot of recreation. We have like um, teams in almost every sport. We have like baseball, lacrosse, hockey. We don't have things like soccer or like any court <laughs> like basketball or anything like that we don't have things like that really? I think we might have like a a rec basketball team because we just got a new like youth center that has a okay. basketball court so like we might have it but I don't know because I like never played on it or never was exposed to it but, yeah um yeah so then and then like our community events I guess we're like pretty huge when I think about <laughs> other communities, like, it's just all, like, coming into perspective now, like, yeah. just based on, like, the friends I have and comparing my experiences to theirs, like, we had, um, we had a fall fair every year, and so it was, like, a little tiny, it wasn't tiny, it was, like, pretty decent, it had, like, some good ones, some good rides, and some games, <laughs> um, uh, every year during the fall time, and then we have, like, our bread and cheese event, which is, like, everybody from the community comes people from outside the community come basically may two four weekend everyone gets in line for like two hours and like lines up for a big huge block of cheese and a big huge that's piece of crazy bread. a block of cheese <laughs> yes i don't know it has something to do with i don't know the story it's more so like just a community gathering and tradition now but like it has something to do with like when we when like the Iroquois people served with the queen or something. She like gave us food or like bread and cheese because like to say thank you and probably because we were starving. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the whole context of that story. Like I'm probably not telling it right, but um, but yeah, like so so. It, but it's really good. Like I don't know if it's good because I grew up eating it every year, but it's like pretty good. <laughs> that that's interesting. That is so interesting because like. Like, yeah, you don't, like you said, you don't have much to compare to, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, like, for me, I compare it to the size of the town, right? Like, I compare it to the size of Emo. Mm -hmm. And I just, I imagine this giant-ass res that is as big as the town that I went to elementary school in, right? The town <laughs> that I go do my grocery shopping in, mm -hmm. right? And I'm yeah. like, this is so weird. And it, like... I can't. I can't comprehend it, but I can. We have, it like... We call people like upper enders and like down belowers, <laughs> depending on where you're located on the road. Okay, so, yeah. Because my mom technically 
would be called like an upper ender by people because she lives on like the I I don't even think it's the northern side but it's like our roads are are numbered like one like first line second line all the way to six and so like if you're at the top or you're like at like between like one and three you're like an upper ender but then if you're like like four to six and you're like technically like a down blower I guess um so Mm -hmm. my mom is an upper ender and my dad is a down blower and so that's kind of funny but um yeah like our res takes probably from one end so if you were to go from like the Brantford side which is like kind of the side that I live on Brantford's like maybe 15 minutes away from my house um and that's like a pretty decent sized town that's where I went to high school um If you drive from, like, my side of the res to the opposite side of the res, which is towards Caledonia, which is where some other kids go to school for high school, um, it takes about, like, if you're going to speed limit, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to drive. Oh, that's crazy. (laughs) Yeah, like, when if you're stopping at stop signs and, you know, you're you're driving the speed limit, it takes about that long. It, It does take quite a while. I don't know how long it would take to drive through our res. I guess it depends on where. If you're just on the highway, I kid you not, it'll probably take you like two minutes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that really is absolutely crazy. I can't. Yeah. One day I will show up on Six Nations and I'll be like, yeah, I'm just when... looking. <laughs> like, I'm browsing. And like the powwows are back and like the community events are back. Like come here. It's It's like a cool place. It's like it has. It's like every other res, though. You know, it has its problems and it has its. No, yeah, right. It has great things about it too, though. But yeah, it's like it's like every other res, just just huge. Oh, I totally just lost my mouse for a second. Um, <laughs> when I think of like how big Six Nations, it makes me think of, I'm like I'm trying to comprehend how big like your pals would be, right? Yeah. So we have. I, it's pretty big. I don't know, though. I haven't been to, like, too many. I've only been to, like, the surrounding areas, and they're, like, roughly the same size, but... Yeah. yeah. And, like, I don't know if anything would ever really say, like, how big it is, right? Yeah. Like, I'm interested to, to like, experience a couple different palettes. Hopefully there are some this summer, because I really want to go to more this summer. But I don't know if that's going to be a thing. I'm going to go look at pictures. Because, like, <laughs> do you know where, what is it, Shakopee is? Uh, I don't think so. Shakopee is another fairly big res uh, down by Minneapolis. But their okay. powwows are absolutely insane. That was the biggest powwow I've ever been in my life. <laughs> like, like, like the they're, like, super like... rich, too. Okay, I feel like looking at these photos, ours isn't... Uh, no, ours isn't that big. Like the 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 dance, what's it called? I'm losing my the name. arbor. Yeah, it's not that big. Like ours is ours is called. Um, I think it's called the Champion of Champion Palos. Uh, Champion of Champions. It's like a competitive. Mm. Um, if what, you. After the interview, I want you to Google the Shaka P Pow, okay? Okay. <laughs> like, even if you just look at the pictures, you'll understand how big their arbor is. But, like, when we went there, we went there on, like, a community family trip, mm-hmm. right? Like, I think it was kind of like a mix of things when we went. Mm-hmm. Um, but you pay 20 bucks for a ticket, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then... You go park in these fields with your car, and then a golf cart will come and pick you up and drive Ooh. you into the arbor because it's so far away. Oh, my goodness. Right? That's Not only that, but, like, it's another competition pow, so people, like, pay to be in it, right? Yeah, yeah. And then if they win, they get quite a bit of money. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also next to the community, and the community is a gated community. <gasps> oh, my God, really? Yeah. Like, it's insane. I want to (laughs) go. It's so bougie. You would love it. You really would. I I feel like ours is like, I think, I think it's ours is 10 or $15. I think it's $15 for the weekend and 10 for the day. 
So, like, if prices are anything to compare, <laughs> like, <laughs> probably a little bit smaller than theirs. See, I've never, Shakopee was the only competition powwow I've ever been to. Yeah, right? see, I've never been to a traditional powwow because, like, we don't have them here. See, that's also interesting because in not the previous episode of the podcast, but the second one with Tashi, mm-hmm. we talked about her experience in powwows, right? Mm-hmm. And she grew up in London, so her and her siblings only know competition powwows. Mm -hmm. Her siblings are used to dancing and winning, right? Yeah. Dancing for money. But here, we don't have competition powwows here. We have Mm -hmm. powwows, like, every weekend, but you just show up. That's so cool. Right? You sign up for grand entry, you dance two times a day, and you get a couple bucks. Right? The older you are, the more money you make. That is so cool. It's it's quite chill. You'd probably like it also. I, I think, think it would I think it would be fun, yeah. Like, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Like like with Shakopee, it does it feels very big and professional and you can tell that there's a lot of money involved, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But like even if you compare it to my community's power, which from what I remember is probably one of the bigger ones in our area, mm-hmm. right? But granted, we are also one of the the reserves that are like more central right mm-hmm. yeah but do you guys... it is it... no go Sorry. ahead go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> do you guys have like vendors and stuff at your pal yeah okay so like it's like every weekend they do that yeah it's not oh, like cool. one it's like different communities oh okay. and it's like the tree three northwestern ontario area okay. so like okay. there's before the pandemic there would always be like a calendar that goes out and mm-hmm. it shows which community is having their pals on which weekend okay right and like a lot of times we just go for a trip sometimes we're driving three hours right See, that sounds so fun we'll just go f- it is it's, it is fun but like when you're a family full of dancers your car is quite stuffed <laughs> and right sure it's like and sometimes and it rains so you're okay rega- yeah sometimes it's rainy so your moccasins are muddy and your regalia is all wet and you can't exactly throw that in the wash yeah <laughs> But it is it is fun. It's always an experience. I like camping at powwows. I see. I've never camped at a powwow because I've only ever been to mine and like the night yeah. maybe one. So like I've never like had the like urge to camp or like wanted to camp. But that's like one see. Thing I do I'm, get that. I'm surprised I've never. I'm surprised my parents actually never took us to like the surrounding like areas, like the couple the ones that are a couple hours away. We never went to like every any other powwows. Me and my sister were gonna do that. I think I think it was like summer of twenty nineteen. We talked about doing it, but we both had like full time jobs, so we just could never could never swing. Yeah, it. maybe maybe after the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's cool. Like Tashi's family is big on powwows. They really are, right? Aww. And mm-hmm. it's cool. And like I use it as an excuse to go to powwows more too, and I just go with them. Mm-hmm. Right, but granted, I also. I used to work weekends a lot um, that I don't know what that's like now <laughs> with this whole <laughs> pandemic and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But not only that, but I mean, I'm, I'm 20 years old now. I'm finally getting my own vehicle. I can finally start going more places where I want to. Right. If I want to mm-hmm. go to power for a weekend, I can go by myself if I want to. Right. And you can just live in your van. That is so cool. <laughs> yes. I don't that even need so a exciting. tent. Like Seth, I can't even tell you that like, I've I, like last year I was like I'm doing it like I'm going to save up buy a van and then I just never saved up and because I found an RV that was like pretty in pretty decent shape and like I've been fixing that the past well I bought it in August last year so I spent this is interesting August- Connor because <laughs> I also have one I do have an RV also I know and then somebody was like oh Seth's RV like they mentioned it like quickly and I was like wait Seth has an RV <laughs> yeah and like at the beginning of Creative Native I was in my RV you were living in it yeah what oh my god yeah i lived in it like all of last summer oh my god see i never i haven't even slept in mine yet because i got it at the end of the summer and it was not sleepable (laughs) at the beginning of or like when i mine mine was in pretty good shape too Mm -hmm. i in terms of like fixing it up i bought it um drove it home i bought it i think not last year but the year before it that winter Mm mm-hmm whatever 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 year that is i bought it then Mm -hmm. and then 
there wasn't much we did in the winter. We waited till the snow melted to kind of start fixing it up, right? Mm-hmm. And then honestly, it's not even fixed to this day. I'm lazy. <laughs> and it's finally not winter. Mm-hmm. So that's nice. But <laughs> yeah, I was just living in it because I just I had it parked at my parents' house. Um, I even lived at my work for like probably about a month because it's a that's historical so center. Cool. And it's just like these like super beautiful grounds and it was like dope. That is so cool. Like I am so excited. So I was like, I'm gonna do van life. Like I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it for the summer and not full time. Yeah. But then I was like, I don't know, I don't I'm not a camper. So like I don't know if I'm gonna like it. So that's why I decided to go the R V route. So I was like, if I hate it, I can just sell it. Like and it'll be have have been a fun project that I didn't spend like that much money on. But, like, that's cool that you're actually doing it. And hopefully this summer I can do a little bit of it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right? And, like, before I bought my RV, I have really did. I've always wanted a van. I was so set. But in my area, you don't see much of the vans, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, the van I'm buying is in Toronto. And it has to be delivered. really? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That's crazy. Right? Like, I have to pay to get it delivered out here. Because I'm just like, well... I can't exactly go out there and get it, especially mm-hmm. with this whole pandemic. I would rather not also. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But I did settle on my RV because it wasn't that expensive. It was in Thunder Bay, which is about three hours from here. Mm-hmm. And I was like, and people convinced me because they're like, well, you'll have more space. And mm-hmm. I'm like, space is nice. I have a lot of craft supplies and stuff, right? Yeah. But... As I was living in it, I'm like, yeah, I do like my RV. I wouldn't mind living in it in this area. But Mm -hmm. it's one of those things that it's large. You need to park it at a park site or some sort of site, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not discreet. But with a camper van, I could sleep on the streets and no one will know. Exactly, yeah. And like, Right? And then especially full time. I'm like, that's ideal, especially if I want to go to school in a city, right? Yeah. And if there's like if you're you can go off-roading with it like it's small enough that you're not gonna get fucking stuck anywhere like you can get right like that was what I was scared about with the RV I was just like I almost had to get it like towed I don't know because I couldn't transport it from Toronto to here because I didn't have insurance on it for like the weekend and I was like oh "Oh my god I'm gonna have to get it towed but does anybody even tow like 24 foot RVs like I don't know (laughs) yeah it's hard it's also interesting because like it, you can only get it, like, the, the temporary license for RVs for, like, what, like, twice a year? hmm Yeah. Right? And that was the thing that I struggled with, too. I got it paid for the once to get it from Thunder Bay to home, and that's it. hmm Right? And I was like, I only have one more chance to transport yeah. it, and then that's going to have to be when it gets safety. Yeah. And that's, like, exactly where I'm at now. I'm like, okay, I need to get it safety now. <laughs> so right? I have- Go get another sticker so that I can take it to the, to the yard where I can, you know, get it safety, which is like an hour away. And I'm like so scared because I'm like, I don't know if I can drive this thing an hour yet. Like I have, I've have i driven it. <laughs> like I test drove it around the block and I was just like, perfect. And then my dad drove it home for me from, from Toronto. <laughs> and now I'm like too scared to even get in the, the driver's seat because it's been so long. Just do it. I like <laughs> driving mine. I would drive mine around the res or... Honestly, I would take it on the back roads. Oh my god! See, I right? need to because get like you're, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna run into cops on the back the back roads here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, we'll just go for a ride. And then, honestly, like, and the year before the pandemic, yeah, the year before the pandemic, I think I already had it. Um, mm-hmm. It's just like I was living at home. I was I wasn't even working yet. No, this was last summer. This was totally last summer. Before I even, like, lived in it, mm-hmm. this past year is just so blank for me. I know. It's a blur. Right? But, like, before I moved into my RV full-time, I was just staying at my dad's house. I wasn't working because of the pandemic, so I didn't have my job at the time, right? Mm-hmm. I was just kind of, like, laid off at the time, I guess. Mm-hmm. And it just was depressing, right? Yeah. I got nothing to do. I just stay home, play games, do nothing. It's sad life. Mm -hmm. But I noticed that, like, if I just took my RV out for a drive in the back roads in the country on a nice summer day with my dog, like, it was just an instant mood booster, like, so bad. It was, like, crazy. I'm like, I can't wait to live this life. (laughs) Yeah. And, like, I was like, I'm going to take it across Canada. Like, 
I'm like, I think as the RV will hold up good enough, like obviously I'm not going to go with an empty bank account in case it breaks down, but like, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to take it, take it across Canada the next summer. Now I can't do that because I'm pregnant, <laughs> but <laughs> like, that was my plan. And hopefully I can do it maybe next summer, but I'm like, do I really want to take a baby in a camper van or like in an RV? I don't know about that. Maybe not like a super young one, but <laughs> yeah. like if you look into it, people do it. Right? I know, People I, live with their families. I saw a TikTok that was like this kid, this like baby, the first like four months of its life went backpacking with this couple. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> right? It's kind of cool though. I don't think I could. I don't think I could do that. Like I definitely don't have enough experience to do that. But I'm like, <laughs> eventually it'd be cool to like take my kid traveling. Yeah. Especially at a young age, I think is always cool. Yeah. Let's go on. Wait, oh, yeah, I forgot my mouse isn't working. Haha. <laughs> I had to look at my list. I want to talk about schooling. Okay. Because that always intrigues me. Mm-hmm. Especially as someone who went through programs that I would like to go through at some point, possibly, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So you studied film. Yes. Right? I studied film. I specialized in film, but like my program, you could kind of go wherever you want it whether it be film television radio like whatever you wanted but I kind of went like the filmmaking like tv route okay I understand so it's like a because you said you said it was media production right yeah yeah which makes sense so it's yeah I guess it makes sense for it to touch on a little bit of everything (laughs) um well like what kind of stuff tell me tell me all about it so I was like I so here's why I went into media because I was like, well, at, first of all, I knew I liked it. Like all I did at at home was like watch YouTube interviews because that was like big when I was like probably like 10 or like when I was like early teen. I think like that's what I was doing was watching videos of like my favorite artists and like bands getting interviewed on YouTube. And I was just like, oh, this is cool. Like, well, how can I do this? And then I was like, oh, I'm going to work in television like I'm gonna like be a television host and then I was like I then I knew I didn't want to do that because I was like so awkward um but I was like yeah like I'll, I'll work in tv and that's like how I'll do this do all these fun things and meet all these cool people so that got me interested and then I was like in high school another reason I got into it is because I also wasn't good at anything else <laughs> like I wasn't good at math and I wasn't good at science which I didn't know until I got to high school um so I was like okay I'm not doing that in school like I'm not doing that in university so then I was like what else can I do like I'm not good at art but I was good at like technology like communications and like storytelling and stuff like that so that's like the route I went and by some miracle I got into Ryerson because it's such a competitive program like I think it was like a 10% acceptance rate when I really yeah like something crazy like fifteen thousand students apply every year and like only 150 get in or something like that that's Um, crazy yeah our our class was really small like it was like you knew everybody in your class like your graduating class um so like i loved it i really liked it and i think like there's a couple I, i don't know people feel differently about film school and like school to like do media and stuff like that because they're like well if you're gonna do it then just do it don't spend all the money but for me like I needed to go to school (laughs) like I would not have like ventured out to do the things that I've done if I didn't go to school um because it was like a confidence builder for me like I needed to gain more knowledge like in like a like a classroom environment to feel confident because that's like what I was used to um but yeah, so first year is like very, very basic. Like you do, we did a podcast in our first year, um, uh, our first year audio class or sound production or something. I can't remember what it was called. And then you do, you have like a, they call it single camera. It's like EFP or is it EFP? I think it's EFP. That's what like they call it in the industry, but like single camera. So that's like movies and the way movies and mostly movies are filmed and then you do half a year or half a semester in a multi-camera studio which is like television 
So, like, you get a taste of everything in your first year, and, like, that's kind of how you decide going forward, like, what you can take more specialized classes in your second year, and then, like, third and fourth year, you really, like, decide what you want to do. So, I knew I wanted to do, like, producing and, like, television, because television was, like, the most fun. Yeah. But, well, like, I don't know. It was the most fun environment, but, like, you don't make a lot of money in television. That's what they tell you. <laughs> so, like, I was like okay, <laughs> if I want to make money out of this, like, I have to be a filmmaker. But um, I went the television route and, like, the business business and television route. Um, but, yeah, Ryerson is, like, it's it's got its controversies. Um, a handful yeah. of them <laughs> with the name alone. Um, but... I don't know. I really liked it. The teachers were awesome. You were learning from professors that were still working in the industry. Like they were taking time off of their normal job at like Rogers to come teach your class. And then they would like, my one teacher was, I think he directed the Blue Jays games. Um, And then like another one, (laughs) he was like, I think he was like, uh, I can't remember what, this teacher was he was like the chair of our school but he was a professor as well and he had worked with like David Bowie and like William Shatner and like just like these crazy people like so you knew you were learning from people who knew what they were talking about and it didn't feel like you were I don't know I feel like sometimes in film school it's like well if these people really know what they're talking about then they would be doing it but like my professors actually were which is really cool yeah and I think that's, like, the advantage of doing it in a place like Toronto. But, like, obviously I'm I'm biased because I've only ever done school like that there. <laughs> but Yeah, it was see, I really understand like... that because that's what it was like at Toronto Film School too, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's a private school, so the teachers there didn't actually need a teaching degree. Oh, really? So, like, yeah, probably, like, one teacher out of my seven teachers only had a teaching degree. Oh, that's interesting. Right? But all my other teachers are working in the industry. They're still in the industry, right? Mm -hmm. Like, my editing teacher, like, he was, like, I can't remember what he was, but he was, like, some creative director for, like, the TV show The Next Star. And, like, that blew my mind because I'm, like, I was a little kid at the time when that was, like, super big. Yeah, that was a huge show. (laughs) And, like, even walking through the halls of my different school buildings, you see all these movie posters for, like, Aquaman and like mm-hmm. Batman and the Flash and like all these like I think even what is it the Lego movie and like the Pixels movie mm-hmm. right because those are all movies that alumni students have like been a big part in mm-hmm. right and it's That's crazy so cool. and like I don't know I think film school can be a really good thing when like people I don't know I know some people like a lot of people think it's like a waste of money but I think it's like a really good thing for those who need it like you know like I definitely needed it <laughs> I would yeah like I right. said I would not be doing what I'm doing or have the confidence to do what I do if I didn't go and like right that's just, exactly how I feel too yeah I would just be doing something else like and like some kids who had like I know I went to school with some kids who like did internships at like Rogers in high school and I was like okay like I did not even know that was a thing like you could do (laughs) in high school like I wasn't coming from that kind of background and so like maybe I could have like went into the industry without school but I was like I definitely couldn't have and so like I'm all for it (laughs) right same especially like I'm also just like they say it's a lot of money but I'm also like but my education's paid for. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, my God. And, like, yeah, like, if you're lucky enough to have funding, I know not everybody is, but, like, you're right. I was lucky enough to get funding for school and, like, to have that paid for. So I'm like, whatever. Like, if you can – if you were going to go to school for something stupid that you didn't love anyways, go for film school, like, that you're going to love. Right? Yeah. It's also part, like, when – because, like, like, a lot of people – like you said, they they don't think that film school is worth it, right? Mm-hmm. But in the whole doing it, if you need it, if you, like, both of us, where we grew up in this area where, like, the film industry is just not really a thing in our lives. We know nothing about it. Like, literally nothing, right? Mm-hmm. So, obviously, going to school is going to be that confidence boost. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And 
now that we both have like kind of like dipped our toes into it and we know more about it it's like it's more of like it's not i don't think film school is really a waste of time for like anyone right in mm-hmm. my eyes it's like if you know about the film industry then maybe you don't have to go to film school right mm-hmm. but yeah. the way i see it is if you don't i think you just have to realize that if they do it this way in film school it's not going to be the right way but it's not going to be the wrong way either yeah exactly like you're just different paths that people take and if you don't right. need it then good for you but <laughs> some people right do. like you're gonna learn something new from every different set that you work on yeah yeah Right, like whether you go to film school or not, but at least film school taught me how to work this camera. At least yeah. film school taught me the basics of cinematography. Right? Yeah. Now I have I re- something to put on my resume. Yeah, I read somewhere like when I was looking at like which schools to go to. Is it worth it to go to Ryerson over like a college and like all that? I was like reading like some thread. It wasn't Reddit, but it was like something along the lines of like yeah, some thread of some guy was like oh, well, I'll just pay, why don't you just pay $15,000, buy yourself all the equipment you need, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, I don't have that kind of money. <laughs> and, like, some yeah. people might have that kind of money to, like, go out and, like, their parents invest in that for them and they learn how to do it and stuff. But I'm like, nobody's going to pay for that for me, but what somebody is going to pay for for me is school. <laughs> so Right, where you can get rentals. Went. Yeah. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to get funding from all my equipment. Mm-hmm. yeah see that's super would, cool right and mm-hmm. like a lot of people in my area still find it cool but i'm also like probably the only film person in my community right mm-hmm. and like, so just making investment. cool stuff blows people minds yeah and it's investment for your community like your community has someone now to create things like that like and who knows right? how to create things like that yeah and that's, that's one of the things that like i had to like really pitch when applying mm-hmm. for it right mm-hmm. And even in the middle of my application, I'm like, this is expensive. Like, ca- my camera is expensive, right? Like, I got the Canon 90D. But that's, mm-hmm. like, that was downselling it also. Like, I could have got the more expensive one, but I was scared to not go too expensive, in for, like, in case they said no. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But I was, like, full send. I was, like, we have a lot of money, right? I was, like, yeah. I'm just going to do it. I was, like, there's a chance they're going to say no anyways. Yeah. And then, and then, yeah, I got it, right? But, like, even to this day, it's just, like, a lot of like applications and stuff just get turned down even though they could be valuable right it just depends on what they see as valuable Mm -hmm. and i'm just i'm glad that they see it as valuable because you don't see a lot of young people applying for stuff like this in my community yeah and that's like one thing that i've learned to like encourage people to do is like ask your community like my community is different like if I go to them for funding they're gonna tell me to fuck off like but like <laughs> because there's so many of us like they can't afford yeah. to be like giving it like to people to every individual who asks so there's like but that means there's a lot of extra programming that you can go through just different avenues but like I learned through working with different like youth councils and stuff like that like learning from my friends communities and stuff that like if you need something, just ask your, your like, community or your council or something like that. Because a lot of times, like, they might say, yeah, like, if you can give them a good enough reason, chances are they're probably going to say yeah, and they're probably going to help you out. Right, or even just give you a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, like, because you're a young person, they want to invest in young people. And also, like, if it's for a good thing, like, then, like, they want to invest in good things that are being done by young people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and like even like even just on that part it's like my community they they say they're all about helping young people and stuff you know but like they say stuff and they don't do stuff mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and i say that in the nicest way possible because i don't want people to get mad at me mm-hmm. right but yeah. it's also just like even if they'd say no to you just you asking less than no that young people do have needs they do want help they do want to try to do stuff better for themselves right Mm -hmm. and it's just like in my specific community it's just like if you ask it just like it just lets people know like youth are still here and they're still trying to they're trying to do something better yeah yeah i feel you i feel i feel you on the level of they say one thing and they do another (laughs) i think that like a lot of people i think honestly i feel like every whether it be like elders or like you know 
just like the general population i feel like everybody feels that way about their community but also like yeah youth i feel like really feel it <laughs> right um, and that's like i work with so like i'm on my community's youth council but i'm also on the uh provincial youth council for ontario and that's like a big thing that we advocate for is like you know stop making decisions about youth and stop talking about us when you're making those decisions but not talking to us because there's like a really a lot of like really strong really like um like passionate and like hardworking youth that like know how to talk about these issues and can give you their opinions and their experiences so that you can make these decisions but you're just like overlooking them which sucks right yeah that that's the biggest thing in my community it is it is interesting it's i don't know Mm -hmm. like you said every community has their their faults right Mm -hmm. and especially at the ripe old age of 20 years old you know (laughs) out of been out of high school for almost two years now right it's just like i see more of it now than i did before and it's more frustrating now than it was before yeah yeah i definitely feel right i'm like it just doesn't make sense. But what the cool thing is, I'm old enough to run for council. So if I do that, Ooh, you know, that'll be cool. That would be cool. Right? It's also interesting because, like, I voted for chief and council for the first time when I was 18. Right? Mm-hmm. And I was just like, interesting. I was like, what's cool is I actually know who I'm voting for because I know everyone in my community. Right? Mm-hmm. But, like, the whole provincial election was a bit weird for me because I'm like, I don't know anything. <laughs> Yeah, right. That feels like a blind, <laughs> blind um, <laughs> vote. Right. This is actually a great time to roll an ad. So here you go. Yeah, I don't know. Voting for council was interesting because I was like, "Ooh, I get to vote for the first time, right?" But mm-hmm. someone I don't remember who it was they were asking me about who were the candidates, and mm-hmm. I was like, "Oh, here are some people." They're like, "Was was there any young people?" And I was like interesting question i was like no there wasn't Mm -hmm. and there just hasn't been Mm -hmm. like ever i mean i'm sure there has been some young people at some point right Mm -hmm. but like that's the thing is i find that people who know the system and like know how council works like they do a good job and whatnot but they also do things in the same way that they've been done year after year whereas like when a new person gets in there or when like a younger person gets in, they don't really have any idea how it works. So then they just start, you know, sprouting out off different ideas that seem like they aren't possible because it's like, Oh, like we don't do that because that's not how we do it. But it's like, well, why don't we do it? Like, (laughs) why can't we do it? Like, can we actually not, or have we just not done it before? Like, yeah, I find that's that's a lot of the case with like, when younger people get in they get told like no we can't do that like but it's like why not (laughs) who said right that's really that's the ongoing conversation every single election year even just every year in general right Mm -hmm. it's crazy you should run for council (laughs) i should (laughs) you should always hype myself i always hype myself up about it but then i'm like by the time next election rolls around which is in actually i don't know when the next one is it was two years, but we moved that to three years long per term, and I just mm-hmm. I haven't been keeping track. Maybe yeah. like a year and a half. But with that said, if I'm in school, I don't know if I can manage. Yeah, that's true. Right? Like having like being full time student and then still having responsibilities yeah. here. Yeah, a council. We'll see. I find that like a council member, even though the community thinks that they don't do anything, like they it's like a full-time job it doesn't end at the end of the day like at the end of the work day like yeah right and like like work like around the clock like even our council like it's not even an actual job oh like yeah for the the basic rules is if you want to be chief and council you can't work for the res Mm -hmm. and you don't get paid like an actual wage you just get an honorarium every month Oh, okay. That's interesting. Yeah, ours it is, like, isn't it? Ours are like salary positions. Or like, See, not salary, like, but they're like honorarium positions. But they're like the same amount as a salary. Yeah, I, I, they're not that much here. I feel like yeah. they would 
should be giving more if they're ex- expected to put that much time in. Mm-hmm. Right. Not only, not even just the time, but just the stress. Right. Yeah. And like, if you're on council, like everybody just fucking thinks it's a free, free pass to like roast you. Right? <laughs> no matter <laughs> what you're doing, like no matter how hard what you're doing is, like you're never going to do a good enough job. And I feel bad. Yeah. Like, people work so hard. I only say this because I know people, I know like people that I care about on council, not my specific one, but like from other communities. Right. Um, like, like, oh, I don't know. I don't know how they do it. It's like a thankless job. And I know some people really suck at it, but some people like really give a shit. And then like the community just like tears them apart. Right. Because they do <laughs> something that's good for the community, but not, but they don't like it. Yeah. Like it's good. It's good for like. 50% of the community, but 50% of the people don't benefit, so they hate it. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Being indigenous <laughs> is hard yeah. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it is. That's like, indigenous, like, politics, Indian politics is is not fun. Like, I've learned that. Right? Like, through, through youth council work, like, I was like, I'm never going to do it. Like, I'm not <laughs> strong enough. Like, I don't have enough, like, grit to do it. Like, like I just... <laughs> hats off to the people who do it for their whole lives because i could not i would just be crying for real my first day that's also just like being a young person it's just like a common mindset within us eh? yeah (laughs) we're like is it worth my time yeah i find that like now we're like a lot more i think entitled but also not in a way because like i feel like before people would do things and like work really hard and allow themselves to get be pushed around and like not be like paid or like yeah i feel like we have a lot more respect for ourselves and our worth as yeah i agree and also but also sometimes i take it too far (laughs) no i get that too i do understand that (laughs) i'm like um i think that i shouldn't have to do photocopies no i'm just kidding i don't do photocopies (laughs) We're, we're remote but like if i did get told to do a photocopy i'd probably be like um i think that's below my pay level no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but like sometimes i'm like oh, okay i need to i need to reel it in <laughs> <laughs> yeah i love that that's why I, I do like being this generation i do mm-hmm. it's yeah. kind of the generation of like of this whole turnover i see it you know we, yeah. get, we get a little bit of the new generation, but we also get a little bit of the old generation. Yeah. We're like the in-between limbo people. Right? And, like, I mean, yeah, I'm on the younger the younger side of this generation, but, like, mm-hmm. I have older friends and siblings, so it's just kind of like, mm-hmm. we, we understand that we are one of the people that, like, have to be the room models and, like, the stepping stones for the next generation, right? Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. something, like, even a lot of older generations don't understand. Yeah, and they, like, don't think that we – they're not, like, aware that we're aware of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, 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 no, they still see us as these little kids. Right? Yeah, yeah. These little res rats that just run around all the time. Like, no, yeah. I have a full-time job. Yeah, and I, like, give a shit about the community. I don't know. But, like, I find it's – I don't know. It's a, it's a hard – it's a touchy subject because <laughs> there are people yeah. who do really great work with you. Especially in my community, there's a lot of a lot a lot of great youth programming, but I know in some other communities it's not that's not so much the case. Yeah. <laughs> well, I am gonna say this is the end of the podcast since we're going on about an hour, which is <laughs> okay. which is fine. It's fine. Uh, yeah. That's pretty average, I think. Okay. Good. I think, I think it's good. Uh, it's enough content. It's enough good content. <laughs> No, it's great content. This is probably, I mean, no offense to every other episode, but it's probably one of my funnest episodes so far. (laughs) Yes, I'm so glad. (laughs) I've never done a podcast or like an interview or like anything like that, so I don't know how it's going to go. See, but that's the thing with this podcast is I want it to be super casual and fun. I don't want it to be so formal, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not just here just to get information. Like, I'm here to get to know you. I'm here for us to bond, right? It's like, it's not just. Right, yeah, it's just it's about being friends, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's that was like the main point of having this podcast. Because mm-hmm. I have these conversations with people all the time. And I was like, mm-hmm. why not share with the world? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like I feel I don't know, I feel like people need to hear just like some casual stuff. Cause like I don't know, with indigenous content, it's like 
sometimes it's just like too hard hitting. <laughs> right, just, right. Just to take a breather and like just like let it be like a good right? time. <laughs> this is exactly what I talked about in the episode zero of Indigo Cast, right? I was yeah. like, this is what I want, and this is why. And that was the exact reason, right? I was like, it's always too negative. And like, yeah, sometimes that stuff needs to be shared, right? It needs to be talked about. I was like, but it also needs to not be talked about sometimes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sometimes I just want right? to shut up. Yeah. We just need a break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're still normal people. <laughs> Yeah, I still like to have a good time. Like we're not all we're not all serious all the time. Yeah. So with the ending of this interview, um, I always just want to thank Connor for coming on today. I appreciate it. It was fun. Um, I hope you had a fun time. <laughs> I had a fun time. I'm really I like it flew by. Yeah, and I will also say that you can follow both of us on Instagram. Connor's Instagram is Little Brown Bear Media. It will also be in the description. Along with my Instagram, which is hello, I am Seth. How cool. <laughs> um, and the last thing I will also say is, is that be, these podcast episodes are uploaded every two weeks on either Sunday or Monday. Yeah. I just got to say that because I feel like people forget. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I hope you have a good rest of your day, Connor. I really do. <laughs> Thank you. You too. I don't know what I'm going to do for the rest of the day. Maybe go eat. That is always a solid plan. You can never go wrong with food. And that finishes up episode four of Indigicast with Connor Martin. Now, wherever you guys are listening, whether it be Spreaker, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, if you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. It means a lot to me. Um, and with that, I will see you guys in two weeks. Thanks, guys. <laughs>